In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a quote from an interview that took place between, who I assume is a journalist, Mika Assayas, and a guy named Bono. Have you heard of him? Lead singer of a little known band called U2. <laughs> Bono is not just known for being a singer, but is also known for being a Christian. And Assayas says to him in this interview, Christ has his rank among the world's great thinkers. But son of God, isn't that far-fetched? Bono's reply is interesting. He says, no, it's not far-fetched. Look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a lot to say along the lines of other great prophets. But actually, Christ doesn't allow you that. He doesn't let you off the hook. Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I'm the Messiah. I'm saying I am God incarnate. And people say, no, no, please, just be a prophet, a prophet we can take. You're a bit eccentric. Don't mention the M word, because you know we're going to have to crucify you. And Jesus goes, actually, I am the Messiah. So what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah, or a complete nutcase. I'm not joking here. The idea that the entire course of civilization for over half of the globe could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase for me, that's far-fetched. Today, we celebrate the end of the church year, the feast of the reign of Christ, Christ the King. And if it's not obvious enough all year round, on today, we put our proclamation of who Jesus is for us as Christians, we place it front and unavoidably center. Yes, we can say that Jesus was a great teacher, a great prophet, a great healer, a great guy. But for Christians, we understand that Jesus is more than that. That Jesus is Lord and King. Which is a way of saying that in Jesus, we understand that the power of God the Creator, the one who called the whole universe into being, that the power of that God is made visible and enfleshed, incarnate, in Jesus of Nazareth. We understand, as Bono said, that yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but we understand his messiahship, his savior, Jesus as savior in a very specific way. We understand that in Jesus, God overcomes that estrangement between human life and divine life and unites human life and divine life fully and completely in the person of Jesus. Now this is a unique claim among world religions that we understand God to be one and yet we understand that one God to be revealed to us in a human being. It's what makes Christianity unique. It's also what has always made Christianity scandalous, problematic to others. How can we possibly say 
that this peasant homeless nobody from 2,000 years ago who lived and taught in the backwaters of the Roman Empire and died as a criminal of the state, how can we say that he was the revelation of God? It's always been tempting for us to go exactly the direction that this journalist goes in this interview and to say, let's just simplify things. Okay, Jesus was a great guy, we can give you that. Why do we need to make it any more complicated? The thing is, and this comes out in Bono's response, doesn't it? Is that that seeming simplification of the message leads to some other complications. It leads to some other complications in terms of the witness and the experience. It leads to complications in that witness, first and foremost, because it doesn't really line up with scripture. That's how we get to meet Jesus first, is on the pages of the Bible. And what we find on the pages of the Bible is we find that right from the outset of Jesus' public ministry, he is claiming an authority and an intimacy with God that people find really outrageous, unprecedented, astonishing. They don't quite know what to make of Jesus. And so we see people divide into two camps. And there's very little middle ground between the two primary reactions to Jesus. Now, on the one hand, the reaction to Jesus is exemplified by the religious authorities, who are just incensed that he would have the nerve to make these claims about himself. Who does this guy think he is anyway? They're even more incensed when he seems to have these signs and wonders and deeds of power that lend credence to what he's saying. And so the plot to put Jesus to death centers around a lot of infractions against all the religious rules, but it centers around this who Jesus was claiming to be and the oneness that he claimed to have with God. On the other hand, on the other hand, we see all of these crowds of people, and they're all from different walks of life, different ages and stages along the way. They find Jesus' claims to be pretty outrageous and sort of unbelievable too, but then they also find that what is more unbelievable is the idea that it's not true. Because they keep being drawn into this experience of how God's love is poured out on them and made known to them in a completely new way as they encounter Jesus. These two polar opposite reactions that we see throughout the scriptures, all four accounts of Jesus' life, get encapsulated in today's gospel passage, this story of Jesus on the cross in his final breaths. And very literally, on the one hand, we see the criminal who just can't believe it. And life has just dealt him such a bad hand that he goes to his grave with scornful, mocking, bitter words on his lips. We don't need to judge that criminal. We can have compassion on him, as I'm sure Jesus had compassion on him. But on the other hand, 
literally, on the other hand, is the other criminal. And that other criminal can't help but to see the truth. He has nothing to be gained by that truth except everything. And so he uses his dying breaths to plead with Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies in a way that would be considered completely crazy if it weren't true. Today you will be with me in paradise. The other complication that arises from trying to simplify our understanding of Jesus is the complication of accounting for what happens following Jesus' death. Now let me tell you, there were a lot of people who showed up on the scene in that time and that place claiming to be the Messiah. People were looking for a Messiah, a savior, somebody to save them from Roman oppression. The ideas of each and every one of those messiahs died when that person died. And yet for some reason with Jesus, for some reason with Jesus when he is silenced and put to death, and he hasn't overthrown the Roman government, and all of his followers should run away chastened and discouraged and disappointed, and for a time they do. For some reason, Jesus' way and proclamation doesn't die. Quite the opposite. Something begins to happen. An experience, not an idea, an experience begins to happen. Jesus' followers begin to experience that Jesus isn't dead. That he is alive and powerful to them in a whole new way. They experience that that oneness with God, that intimacy with God could be available to them too. They begin to experience that as they join their lives to the way of Jesus, that an incredible new life becomes possible in them. Forgiveness becomes possible in them. Receiving their identity as forgiven and then being able to share that forgiveness with others. The experience of being a beloved child of God and somehow knowing themselves as a beloved child of God shapes how they encounter others, neighbors and strangers, and these barriers that have always been up between people begin to come down. They experience that there's this radical alternative to that me-centered survivalism that we are so relentlessly taught. Put yourself first. They begin to experience that the way of self-offering and service isn't actually about sacrifice at all. It's about joy. They begin to experience how they can be part of shaping this world into a place of justice for all people, and they can fight with everything that they have for that justice. Because when they do that, they are welcoming the kingdom of God. And they begin to experience how Jesus' death wasn't the end of the line but rather an opening of the gates of heaven. And that maybe they don't need to be imprisoned by that fear of death either. 
these experiences mushroom far beyond that first little group of followers convinced by Jesus. It mushrooms, that experience mushrooms in a way that nobody anticipated across the Roman Empire, down across the ages. People in every time and place, culture, background, age, ethnicity, share something of that powerful truth. That Jesus is more than a great guy. That Jesus has something to offer us that is transformative and real and undeniable. And that mushrooming across the generations comes to us here today in our gathering and in our proclamation. And I can tell you as a priest in this church that I get to talk with you and have conversations with you about faith and I get to share with you in questions and doubts and wondering and wrestling with what it is that we believe. But I also get to hear your stories of how you have been touched and convinced by these same sorts of experiences of how walking in the way of Jesus has transformed and shaped your life and offered you something of beauty and hope and possibility. So here we are today on this Sunday, the end of the church year, and we are making this outrageous claim. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord undeniably outrageous. And yet, maybe what is even more outrageous? Given the witness, given the testimony, given the experience, maybe what's even more outrageous is denying that it's true. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is actually, experientially, powerfully Lord. Amen.